We're called to make disciples of all the nations. So what is the missionary's biblical relationship with his or her own nation? Should it be one of nationalism, patriotism, or something else? And what about the rest of the nations? We'll explore these controversial questions on today's episode of the Missions Podcast. But first, let me tell you about Daniel. Daniel fled his home in Peru when he was 12 years old after his drunken father threatened to kill him. Daniel became an alcoholic like his father. One day, he ended up at a local church. But as a Roman Catholic from his upbringing, Daniel resisted the evangelical gospel that he heard and vowed to disprove Christianity itself. Well, that didn't last long. Daniel was converted and he developed a passion to share the gospel with the lost. That's when ABWE missionary Steve Douglas noticed and began discipling him for nine years. Today, Daniel has founded a seminary in his city of Arequipa, and he's planted 15 churches of his own. Daniel's special, but he's not unique. We're finding partners like these all over the world. And in this changing global climate, we can continue to do greater things for the Great Commission by partnering with people on the field, already risking all to make disciples. Your gift to the Global Gospel Fund can impact a 1,000 missionaries working in more than 70 nations. Become a partner now. Go to abwe.org slash globalgospelfund20. That's abwe.org slash globalgospelfund20. Have you ever been approached by a student expressing a missionary call? For the last 15 years, Spurgeon College's Fusion Program has been equipping students for missions through life-on-life -life discipleship, college coursework, and intensely practical training. If you know a student desiring to become a missionary, send them to Fusion at Spurgeon College as their next step. To learn more about how we are equipping students for a lifetime, visit SpurgeonCollege.com slash Fusion. Welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Kochman, Director of Advancement and Communications with ABWE, joined by Scott Dunford, West Coast Advancement Coordinator, Lead Church Planter, Redeemer Church in Fremont, California. Well, we started with kind of a doozy of a conversation starter at the beginning of the episode, right before our break. And uh, this idea of, of quote unquote, Christian nationalism is not only blowing up social media right now, but as with anything else, you throw a term out there and you don't define it, we immediately find ourselves in the waters of controversy. Now, we should say at the outset, we're not a political show. We're not cultural analysis. This is a missions show. But when I hear words like that and I hear people talking about the Christian's relationship to the nation, my mind can't help but immediately think, Scott, about the Christian relationship to the nations. And that's mm. something that we want to dive into a little bit further today. At the outset, though, Scott, you know, you've felt this intently in a personal way, right? When you served as a missionary in East Asia, um, I would just love to hear briefly, maybe it's hard for you to encapsulate this. But what were some of the personal emotions that you felt learning a new country, saying goodbye to your old one, and yet still loving your home and your roots and, and, and your culture? Because I think that plays into some of this conversation that we need to have today. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It was very, it's very complicated emotionally. And I think uh, when I talk to missionaries, especially those who have served very long times, um, longer, far longer than we did, I think it, it, it becomes even more complicated because you do develop a love uh, for the new country that you're, that you're living in. And uh, I think especially new missionaries sometimes struggle because they, they see more of the flaws of their old home, their, you know, their, their home of their birthplace. And, and, uh, and then that kind of evolves over time, but backing up a little bit, um, I can remember my first kind of confrontation with the ugly side of this was when um, we were speaking in a church, it was in mid Michigan, you know, a heart of industrial decline in America. And uh, I was speaking about this particular country we were going to serve in, one that was kind of a, a manufacturing hub and had been accused of stealing lots of jobs. And and I, I had a, a big burly guy after the service walk up to me and after I was making this impassioned 
you know, appeal to, to spread the gospel in these places. And he said, when I heard you were speaking about this country, I was mad because they've stolen so many of our jobs. And I'm like, why would they, you know, why would they, you know, why don't they deserve the gospel? They don't, you know, and he's like, but you got through to me, you know, and he, he ended up with a kind of a good story mm -hmm. in that he was yeah. deeply convicted about his nationalism, I would say, and, uh, yeah. and unhealthy nationalism. I would say as a, as a missionary though, um, you know, one, you feel like a growing love for the country you live in because you love the people that you're, that are there. And, and it's not that you love the form of government necessarily, uh, but you, you learn to appreciate parts of the culture and parts of their history and, and love the same thing. So when they celebrate their national day, you're out there with their little flags and, and you're thankful for that country. I, but at the same time, like when 4th of July rolled around, you know, we got a group of Americans together and we shot off fireworks and had a little mm -hmm. muted celebration of gratitude toward our country, you know, and then coming back, I can remember we came back in yeah. July uh, and, and, you know, showing up at, at, uh, one of my family members churches and, and, you know, like the whole story, it was like one of those faith and freedom services. And, you know, my kids were like, I thought we were going to church. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm sorry, this is church <laughs> because we're singing, you know, all of these yeah. American songs and everyone's red, white, and blue. Yeah. And, and it just was very confusing, even to my young children of going like, wait a second, this doesn't seem Christian. This seems like a political rally or, you know, something like that. And so, you know, missionaries, I think, feel that tension between, you know, the, the a, a divided uh, allegiance uh, to a nation. And, um, and I, I kind of wonder if that is actually, isn't actually a really, really healthy thing. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Well, and, and that's what we're going to dive into. I, I think it can very easily be unhealthy. Now um, I grew up hearing a, a definition of these two terms, nationalism and patriotism that are, um, I, I think sometimes in common speech used interchangeably, Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the sources of misunderstanding right now. I, I think that when people throw around those terms right now, uh, a lot of laymen think, well, what's the difference? And right. in, in as much as, as they use them interchangeably, um, well, there's nothing wrong with nationalism, right? Like you should love your nation. That's cool. You can, you can as a Christian, love your nation. And we can talk more about that. Um, but that's not always how they've historically been defined, um, especially in relation to each other. George Orwell had a good quote, uh, Orwell even being a, a, certainly not a Christian and also actually a man of the political left and not of the political right. Uh, but he was sort of a prophet in his own right. And he had a good quote about the the, the meaning of nationalism, which I'd, I'd love for you to share with our listeners in just a second here. Um, but but it is a challenging question. And, you know, for, for myself, I, I, I don't see a tension with Christians loving their nation you know, at all. And, and I, I want us to approach that through a biblical lens and dive into that. Go ahead. And, and can you share that Orwell quote with us? Sure. He said by, by pay, he's, he's, it's from his essay notes on nationalism and okay. uh, distinguishing patriotism from nationalism. So he said by patriotism, I mean devotion to a particular place in a particular way of life, which one believes to be the best in the world and has no wish to force upon other people. Patriotism is of its nature defensive, both militarily and culturally. Nationalism, on the other hand, is inseparable from the desire for power. The abiding purpose of every nationalist is to secure more power and prestige, not for himself, but for the nation or other unit in which he has chosen to sink his own individuality. Um, so I, mm. I think he's making a statement that nationalism is a is a negative thing in the sense of that it is... Um, it is so it is a it is a it wants benefit for their country at the expense of other countries, whereas patriotism yeah. is a love or a gratitude for your nation, appreciation of what it brings, but also is more defensive of of of, of itself rather than trying to oppose it on others. Yeah, I think that's a fair distinction there. You know, the nationalism by itself, the word doesn't you know, seem weird until you think of ways that that's been used, right? That what was the Nazi party? It was the national socialist party, right? Mm -hmm, There's, mm -hmm. you know, there, there is a, a dark underbelly to what nationalism has meant. Um, it, even though on its face, you know, there is this, I think, good Christian virtue, which is a benign sort of love of neighbor and, and love and appreciation for, for the nation. And that would be better described with the term patriotism. But really, there's another issue here too, in the word itself that, Anytime we're adding ism to the mm. end of something, yeah, we're making that central to the system. And really right now, you, you see it in the church. You see it certainly in politics. 
Uh, but it's it's this um, there, there's a, a sweeping wave of, of populism, which you know, we're, you and I are, are both as Protestants. We think that hey, the average person with Bible in hand can make a big difference, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it shouldn't always belong to the expert class to be leaders in society. Uh, but at the same time, if the God of the system is the nation, uh, or even those patriotic values, um, loving the system uh, that we enjoy here in America, which I think uh, in the United States in particular, uh, yeah. God's providential hand has really been at work here. And I think what has happened historically in the nation's past and our founding, though we're not perfect, is is pretty unique um, in, the, in the course of history. And, and we should credit all of the, the common grace blessings that we enjoy here to the Christian worldview. Uh, but anytime those values or the system of government itself or the, the people, the nation, any of those things, anytime they become the God of the system and Christ is removed from the center, the center does not hold. You can't make anything else central and add the ism to the end of it or, or of necessity, things will become disproportionate and out of alignment in a little while. So, you know, maybe another question for you is you, you kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but how can it, first of all, can, is it, is it possible for a missionary to live overseas and to really do some incarnational ministry and, and embody the, the language and the people and the, the, the cultures and customs? How do you still patriotically uh, love your nation? And how do you even tell the difference between that? And, or, or is there this national impulse uh, in me where maybe I'm going to be kind of like that congregant that you alluded to earlier, uh, who was kind of a Jonah figure, right? Who was at odds with the, the country that you were presenting and talking about? He didn't love that other nation. So can you hold those things together as a missionary on the field? And I, I wrestled with this personally a lot. Um, because when you're away from your home country, you can look back and so much more clearly see the deficiencies and the problems, you know, and uh, I think a lot of missionaries struggle sometimes with that, um, about looking back and just being very, becoming very critical of their, of their home country. And, and uh, I, w- I would say I'm, I'm much less nationalistic than I was before I served overseas. <laughs> um, and I hopefully it doesn't offend too many people, but it's just, I'm trying to be honest. Um but I do, I did kind of come to a place personally where I, I re- was able to look at patriotism and love of country as a, a expression of actually gratitude and thanksgiving um, mm. and, and maybe like even that. of stewardship. So, so uh, now yeah. that I'm, you know, I'm living in America and I've been in America for a number of years in a row and uh, don't plan on moving overseas anytime soon, like, re- understanding one, gratitude is a good thing and being able to look and say, okay, these are, there are good blessings that God has given me through this nation with all of its flaws and, and checkered history. There's also so much, go- so many good things that are there too. Mm-hmm. And so is grat- gratitude is a very Christian uh uh, command and impulse. So, so, Mm. you know, being grateful for your country and thankful for your country, I think can look like a healthy form of patriotism. I also, um, I also, uh, see it through the lens of, of stewardship. So, you know, I, by, by nature of Providence, I'm not a Canadian, you know, (laughs) by Providence, Mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, Vietnamese by Providence. I'm not German and in my nationality. Um, and so, you know, according to, not, and, and, and not there's anything wrong with that. We, we yeah, no, but d- just in God's providence, this is where I was born and, and I'm a citizen of this country, not some other country. And so, um, I think good stewardship means that I should care about, you know, promoting the good, good and right and holy virtues in this country and being involved in those as much as is, is possible while still maintain, you know, understanding there is a, like the lure of power, you know, we've, we've seen a number of court evangelicals, you know, on the left and the right, keep, peek, you know, peek their heads up and, and attach themselves to power. And we have to recognize like, yeah, that could be alluring to me. You know, if I got a call from the president or the president elect, you know, I would find myself drawn into that orbit and feeling, wow, I'm, I've, I've influenced suddenly. And that could be an intoxicating mm-hmm. drug for a Christian. Um, but also, yeah. um, you know, not thinking about my true citizenship in heaven instead of focusing exclusively on my citizenship on earth. So we know there's been a concerted effort in American history and other countries to, to create a, a type of, of a civic religion that looks like Christianity, but isn't. And I think that there sure. is a, a danger of being called into that, that idol too. Um, yeah. do, do you, do you feel the same tension or, am, or do you think I'm a little off? 
No, I, I think that that's there. I mean, I, I, I'm not what, let, let's talk about the United States, right? Most mm-hmm. of our listeners, not all, but most of us are coming from the United States and, you know, in the United States founding, uh, I'm, I'm not a believer that all of the founders were purely deists and that, that it was this entirely enlightenment project, right? I, I think that, that, um, there is a lot about the, the faith of the founding fathers, which now granted they weren't also, you know, card carrying evangelicals, uh, the vast majority of them. But I, I think as with most things, right, that the truth is somewhere in between. And, um, I, I think that there's also a, a lot of things then in the founding of this nation, um, that are attributable to the Christian worldview, um, that, that we can rejoice in and be grateful. And I also want to specify too, um, you know, to, to be a patriot in a biblical way is not just to extract and abstract the virtues of your country and be thankful for those. I think you can also be thankful for them in the flesh and blood of the country itself, in its history, in its culture, with all of its warts, with all of its foibles, right? So, and, and you, can, you can do this with, with really any uh, legitimate country and culture and, and, and government, um, you know, it, it, you don't have to be embarrassed by it, but let me, let me extract the moral good. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad certain things happened, um, but, but rather you can be thankful for the United States itself or for Canada itself, if that's your country of origin or, or wherever you're listening from, wherever you hail from, you can um, thank God for what he did in history there, even when human sin played a major role in, in how things unfolded historically. There is a gratitude there and there's a major social pressure one, yeah, to build this civic religion, which is a, a danger. And the, the fusing of Christianity with, um, with this power-grabbing national um, identity sort of politic and Christian nationalism, and, and you see this in, in kind of caricatured form even in, in, in recent weeks um, in the U.S. Capitol. Yeah, that's extremely troublesome, as is the effort for uh, Christians to be made to feel uh, guilty for the providence of God. Uh, in our history, right? We can recognize sin without feeling weighed down by guilt and grief and shame rather than turning our grief and guilt and shame over to Christ and being made new and then being free to be thankful for what God has done in our past and to to turn him and pray and repent and look forward to what he does in the future and also to to steward and share with others the common grace blessings that we enjoy. Um, So I think you make some good points there, but I also want to ask a different question. We're talking about loving the whole country and loving the whole nation. Is that even possible, Scott? And what I mean by this is, you know, even evangelicalism, there's a movement and you have uh, Tim Keller's works on, on loving the city. And mm-hmm. it's a very popular idea. Um, in fact, I believe ABWE's conference coming up next year, the, the whole goal is to communicate urban church planting and God is the God of the city. Okay. So, so Mm. there's a lot of, of good there about loving your locality. And then we, we talk about that, that, that can be a trendy, attractive topic in some ways. When we talk about loving the nation, suddenly uh, we, we get a little bit scared and we think what, what kind of weird flag waving thing is this? And, And first of all, it's interesting that we don't feel that same tension about loving the city, but when we talk about loving the nation, there's maybe idolatries there that we're worried about that we're not as worried about with loving the city. And really the question is, is it even possible to love an entire country? I mean, spanning an entire continent, the United States does at least, what is the idea of this nation? Is, is it one nation? I mean, it's it, the city that you live in is so completely different from the city that I live in, right? We're uh-huh. separated by thousands of miles and social media has connected us to make it feel like this is this one whole thing. And we are under one federal government. I'm not, not denying that at all. Um, but it, it would sort of like, it, wouldn't it be like Paul saying, love the, the entire Roman empire? I mean, you're talking about a massive uh, smattering together of cultures, of, of peoples, is it helpful to think about loving that whole massive thing or is that too big an undertaking? Should we just focus on loving the city or loving your, your neighbor immediately next door? Do, does that question make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a challenging, there's a, there's a lot to, to dive into there. I mean, I do, I do think that the idea of place we need to give a lot more attention to in that. Um, right. I mean, clearly when Ezekiel, I think it's Ezekiel, right. Is talking about, you know, about, about the this you know the city and making it making your home there and seek seek the, the welfare, benefit uh, yeah, it's Jeremiah well, twenty nine Jeremiah yes, that's right welfare I, of the city yeah I, I had I had a major prophet um so at least I was in the right <laughs> section of scripture <laughs> um 
you know, so there is something to By the way, speaking of Christian nationalism, we don't have any prophets today. (laughs) <laughs> period for the record keep going scott <laughs> that's alex's unvarnished opinion unvarnished. that's right no no nuance no qualifiers yeah, period. Right. No, no profit, yeah. but christ okay go, go on scott interesting okay that's a whole nother discussion point but uh <laughs> but it, so so okay yes we we understand that and christ we see jesus example right of just him weeping over jerusalem and just saying you know mm. you know and, and really personifying jerusalem and saying you know you jerusalem have killed the, the prophets you know uh how i long to gather you in my arms well you know i mean mm. he's speaking about you know he's he's looking back and grieving over a long history of this city and you know and just this week in our church what we've been preaching through the advent the places of of the incarnation and this week was mm. jerusalem and pastor bob uh, Bixby was preaching on this topic and, and, uh, on Jerusalem and, and, and saying, okay, here, here's Jesus's grief over this, this city and the no city in the world had had more, more gospel witness and more prof, you know, more touches from the Lord. And yet here they were yeah. in complete rebellion to God. And, and, it, and it's all been kind of condensed into this personification. So there is something to that. Um, and then in, in with, with nations, it is interesting, you know, the time of, of the God of the epistles. And I, I'm just kind of talking off the top of my head here, but like, you know, you have this empire Rome and then you've got these kind of, you know, nations within it, you know, kind of, you know, you have Judea and, and Samaria and you've got, you know, Galilee and they're being kind of governed in different ways. And, you know, the whole Palestine was, was split up into four different, uh, you know, the, the, the Tetrarch idea, you know, of like four different little, you know, fiefdoms underneath the Roman empire. So even in that time, you had this kind of a strange idea of what is the nation at that point, you know, but you also have Paul uh, dealing with the, 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 na- the ethnicity of, of the Jewish people and, and uh, thinking right. of them in, in a way. So yeah, I, all that to say, I don't know. <laughs> uh, clearly, you know, clearly the Bible talks about nations a lot. Uh, talks yeah. about ethnicities also um, talks about cities a lot. And so there is something where the place of ministry is important and we do need to dig in and dive in and learn to love, um, you know, the, the places and work to love the places and see those places, you know, um, the, the people within right. those places discipled, right? I, how, how are you processing yeah. all this? Well, there, there are ambiguities there because that's why we did an entire two hour uh, episode of the podcast earlier this year on who are the nations mm-hmm. right during T4G. Mm-hmm. Um, so somebody wrote to me the other day and said, Hey, have you, have you ever discussed like, what is the definition of, of ethne? And I'm like, we have actually. And, and we sent that link. If you're a new listener to the show, um, <laughs> go to our site and, and um, in the top tab there, there's our T4G 20 uh, webcast that we did. And we had a, a big old panel and it was an engaging conversation about who are the ethne in Matthew uh, 28, 19, uh, Pantata ethne, all the nations. What does Jesus by, n- mean by nation there? Does he mean countries? Does he ne- mean right. ethnicities, language groups, geopolitical countries? Um, and to some level, the, the answer is a little bit of all of those, right? And that plays into this question too. Um, should we love our nation in terms of, of its political order or in terms of the ethnicity of the people that are in it? or in terms of, of the, the history of the, the body politic. I mean, again, we can be thankful to God for all of those things. But there's, there's two other directions I want to go with this, and we've got to take a break. But when we come back in a minute, I want to discuss, first of all, the text of Scripture, and what does the Apostle Paul have as far as answers for us on this. And then I also want to talk about what's often opposed to nationalism, which is globalism, and what does that mean for us? Cross Conference 2020 is coming. This December, gather a group of 18 to 25 year olds in your living room or church auditorium and join the Cross 20 live stream. Your group will hear from David Platt, Trip Lee, John Piper, and others as they aim to emphasize the clarity of the gospel, the centrality of the local church, and God's heart for the nations. Registration is just $10 per person. You can learn more and register at cross20.com. Learn more again and register at cross20.com. Hi, I'm Scott Dunford, and I'd like to share with you about a new nonprofit ministry established to help churches, Christian schools, and other ministries protect children and prevent abuse. Rich Hamar from Church Law and Tax states that the number one reason that drives churches to court is child sexual abuse. 
I can't think of anything more devastating to these lives, their families, and our witness before a watching world than sexual abuse that takes place in ministry. The traumatic impact often leaves the vulnerable not wanting anything to do with God or his people. Our efforts toward evangelism, discipleship, and spiritual formation are not only neutralized, but shattered. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention was formed to help ministry leaders understand the complexities of child protection and abuse prevention. They are establishing standards and an accreditation program that will help verify that appropriate measures are in place at your church or ministry. Learn more about them. Find a helpful and free assessment tool to help you see how you measure up in this area. Go to abuseprevention.org and click on the link for this resource assessment. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention. And this June, attend the National Conference. Go to abuseprevention.org and register with ABWE21 as the promo code to receive 20% off your ticket. That's promo code ABWE21 to receive 20% off. Brooks Buser, president of Radius International. I am here with Mark Dever, senior pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist and president of Nine Marks. When you go to a culture that's a different language than yours, you're ending up in a kind of majority language that's been reached. And there are other peoples still more hidden, and it's those people who are often almost entirely unreached, and they take more cross-cultural effort Is there a way we can better train people to have more realistic expectations of what life is like in the kind of two steps away from my culture and be able to sustain family life with its normal difficulties there so that there can be a long years and even decades long witness in that culture? And it seems like Radius is set up to provide that training. Radius is about reaching unreached people groups. Go to RadiusInternational.org, RadiusInternational.org. We're back talking about the missionary's relationship to his or her home country. Is it one of nationalism, patriotism, or something else? And Scott, let's get into the text of scripture. I want to use the Apostle Paul as a lens. Then I also want to address the other elephant in the room, which is globalism. Uh, This is a global missions podcast, so what role does that play? Mm -hmm. Real quick before we do that, I'll just throw this out there. I'll just summarize my position, and you can interact with it before we dive into the Apostle Paul. Uh, You know, Christian nationalism is a slippery term because nationalism is a a term with some really strong negative connotations about um, centralized power and and idolizing the the nation itself and sometimes the ethnicity itself. Uh, But Jesus also says, disciple the nations. And so I, I don't, I don't want Christian nationalism, um, but I, I do want a Christian nation. I, I want a, a nation that recognizes the lordship of Jesus Christ. Um, a friend of mine on Twitter uh, the other day uh, said this. He said Christians can live under political persecution while Christians often die under political persecution. Christianity is not nationalism, but Christians should love their nation. Um, through Christi, excuse me, though Christianity and nationalism are two separate things. They're things that happen to overlap in the Christian life. By nationalism there, he, he means, I think, what we would call patriotism. Uh, to equate Christianity with nationalism is wrong. But for Christians to not be concerned about their nation is also wrong too there. So in the realm of missions, I think it would be a mistake for us to not care about our home country either, to become so jaded and disenfranchised with our home country that we only ever want to focus on the nations abroad without dealing with the problems that we have, have here at home too. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, just to clarify, you know, when you're talking about disciple the nations, that is goes back to that whole pontata ethne discussion of of what is uh, ethne, and you you know, so I think I think we come to the conclusion that it's not talking about geopolitical units necessarily. Or do you take a different view on that? I mean, I would say not necessarily, but not necessarily to the exclusion of. I actually remember we talked about that with Vishal Mangalwadi back in one of our first episodes, didn't we? That like. I, I think it refers to the ethno-linguistic people group, especially the language group. But I, I don't know that, you know, um, that Matthew is sitting there writing that out and in his head thinking, boy, I sure hope people don't confuse this with geopolitical countries, right? Like, I, I think it's all together because people group themselves together. People also self-identify based on culture and language and people group themselves together under governments, right? And I, I think I want to see that whole thing discipled. So, so with that background, can you repeat the question? I don't know if I can, I don't remember. <laughs> no, the, the question is, I mean, how can we, um, 
you know, is there is there a danger, Scott, that that we could also become so disenfranchised with the nation and so turned off by, um, you know, the patriotic elements that we we turn to missions, you know, as this false source of relief when sometimes God would also say like, hey, deal with the problems at home and disciple your nation in addition to all the nations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but but I I, I I'm trying to think, you know, through the biblical examples, but I, I think we can see it, you know, very personally it's easy for us to just get so caught up in the macro, right? That really we have very little control over, you know I mean? You think about the, even the political, you know, stuff that's going on in our country, like as me and myself, Scott Dunford, the individual, you know, I, I have the ability to go in and cast a ballot or even make my voice heard or show up in an online forum or attend a protest if I choose to, but like the ability for me to do one, to, to really make, massive impact on such a big stage is, is small. Right. But, right. but, but daily I have these opportunities to love my neighbor, to, to share the gospel with the people around me, to disciple my family, to engage with my church. And I do think that, you know, that there are so many Christians who get stuck in like the, the cable news cycle, whether that's, you know, whatever that, whatever the case may be on either end yeah. of the spectrum that they get yeah. so caught up in that and thinking right. that's somehow going to be the salvation of our nation or any nation um, mm-hmm. that they really lose sight of like, what are you called to do today? And, and, you know, people are even leaving churches over, you know, what they perceive as their pastor's political affiliations or the other, you know, the, my church is too liberal or my church is too conservative th- politically. And, uh, and, and that's causing huge divisions. And if, if that's the mentality we take, then it isn't going to be long, I think, before we, we see other people groups in other parts of the world, not just as, as lost and needing of the gospel and discipleship, but really as enemies of our way of life. And I think that's yeah. a really dangerous uh, trajectory for the church. I, I think they're understanding people and loving people uh, first, uh, and then having a, a healthy gratitude or healthy like Christian patriotism uh, toward my own country secondarily and recognizing I think primarily, right? We're citizens of heaven. You know, we're we're citizens of the New Jerusalem, and uh, you know, our our names are are recorded in the annals of of the New Zion. You know, and uh, and and I think that has to be our first. Uh, there's a reason that I think that Paul talks about us as aliens and strangers, in that and mm. that we, while we're part of this world and we're part of this place, we all feel a longing for that place that is truly home to us. Um, yeah, so. I, I agree. Yeah, I, I agree with so much of that. And because you you brought up scripture, let's let's dive in now. So I, I just think that the Apostle Paul, as always, is helpful. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and here in particular. So in Philippians three, he says this and he says similar things in Galatians too. Uh, he's listing all of his credentials, right? He's, he's given his Jewish, um, you know, rabbinical CV, right? Um, he talks about we are the the true circumcision in Philippians chapter three, verse three, and we put no confidence in the flesh though. So then he, he says, though I have myself reason for confidence in the flesh. Also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, mm-hmm. a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And, and, and so he, he goes on from there. Um, it, it's funny, you know, tribalism is, I think, something that we'd all agree, like, yeah, there's too much tribalism right now. You could also make the case, like, there, maybe there's a godly form of tribalism, like, you should love your tribe. You shouldn't mm-hmm. not love your tribe, right? Like, sure. it, it is interesting there. Um, but, uh, but, but he says, not only is he a member of the people of Israel, it, religiously, he doesn't just worship Israel's God. He takes joy or took joy and delight in um, being of a particular tribe, being a Hebrew of Hebrews. You know, Hebrew is, is an ethnic uh, term, uh, especially. And yet, in verse 7, but whatever gain I had, all of those things that he was proud of uh, and had good reason to be proud of. I mean, Benjamin, that was a, was a powerful tribe in the, in the southern kingdom whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Loss, mm-hmm. uh, scubalon, mm-hmm. rubbish. Mm-hmm. Um, you, could, you could translate that um, with some pretty foul terminology if you wanted to. It's, it's trash. It's dung. Uh, he disregards it. 
compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He says, for his sake, I suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. There, there is the mm-hmm. key term there, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. Now, and you also think about this, Scott, like, you know, nationalism in general is one thing for us as Gentiles. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But if you're going to be proud of any nation, you'd be proud of the nation that God specifically revealed himself to and gave them the law, right? Like, if you're going to be proud of a nation, that'd be one to be proud of. Um, That's why Zionism is still a thing, (laughs) because people are, um, you know, proud of, 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 of that, um, that inheritance that they have, but, but Paul counts it all as rubbish. And so there's one passage there where you see that Paul is totally willing to, to sweep that aside for the sake of Christ and his gospel. His identity first and foremost is as a Christian, not as a Jew, not as right. a, a, a white skinned or brown skinned person and not, not as a, a Roman right? His identity is in Christ. So there's another passage though, that I think also helps us see like practically day to day, how did Paul continue to live? But that's where he starts in his gut with forsaking those things in comparison to his, his love for Christ. What what are your thoughts, reactions to that? Yeah, I think that's an important perspective. I mean, if anyone would have reason to be, you know, to count his national, I mean, especially speaking from a Jewish perspective that had had, you know, uh, always viewed their identity as a chosen nation as, as some reason to boast. And, uh, by by declining that, I mean, how much more so should we think of our, our national heritage, not as something necessarily to be like embarrassed about. I mean, I don't think he was embarrassed about his background at all. Uh, but, but, uh, but certainly didn't see that as a thing that gave him standing before the Lord in any possible way. Yeah. And and yet you think, okay, so how did he live practically, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's sort of like what, when you see in Colossians and Galatians, you know, in Christ, there's no male or female. Well, that's true, but gender roles aren't erased by Christ either, right? right? And so Paul counted his Jewishness as lost for the sake of Christ. You know, that doesn't mean that he walked around saying that he wasn't a Jew anymore. He was mm-hmm. still thoroughly Jewish. Um, so so how, how did Paul walk this out? And my mind goes to Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, after going through this momentous description of the gospel in the first eight chapters, Paul says, I'm not lying. I speak the truth in Christ. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites. And he, de- he describes all the blessings that Israel's had, right? The worship, mm-hmm. the giving of the law, the promises, the covenants, the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who's God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Uh, that's Romans 9, 1 through 5. And so his national identity is scubalon to him. It's, it's rubbish. And yet he still feels this affinity to his kinsmen, according to the flesh. And it's not this they can do no wrong sort of thing. It's, it's not uh, nationalism in the sense that, you know, they're wrong and uh, they're right and everybody else is wrong and everyone else should suffer and pay and and give them power. Rather, it's, you know, Paul's Jewish nationalism is, I weep for this nation to come to the knowledge of Christ. I I want to see them repent, you know, and and maybe there's a lesson for us here, not that America is Israel by any chance, or whatever your home country is. Again, we have plenty of listeners outside the U.S. Loving that nation doesn't just mean walking in lockstep with them. Walk, loving your nation means weeping and, and yearning to see them come to the saving knowledge of Christ too. What are your thoughts on that passage? You know, I, I, yes, I, I agree with you. I, I also wonder too, I mean, Paul, I mean, if there's something to be said about how Paul understood circumcision and and I know this is kind of taking it a totally different direction than what you're asking. Well, we're, we're going there. Let's, let's go, let's go talk but, about circumcision. And we just lost all of our <laughs> <laughs> but you you have this you you have this contradiction of sorts right where paul uh okay. paul has timothy get circumcised but then refuses to have titus get circumcised and and you know I, I, circumcision certainly in this time is like a is like the identity marker of of you know certainly of being a being a Jew, right? And, uh, yeah. and even, even if you're a converted Jew, it still is the marker, right? For that, for, 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 for people. And, and so it makes me think that, that there was a way that Paul kind of viewed this in a, 
in a, a liberty type of way. Like, it, it, does this help advance the gospel? Um, does, does Timothy identifying with the Jewish people in that way uh, seem to help uh, help promote the gospel in a way that that Timothy and Paul were free to do? But then also he saw that as being a, a difficult. A, a, detrimental to the gospel with Titus. And so Titus yeah. doesn't do that because of the theological controversies that were arising, you know, at that time that it was going to cause it more of a stumbling block. And I, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to say, you know, we have some freedom here to think through how does this affect the proclamation of the gospel with how much we lean into or lean out of, um, you know, this, uh, the, the flag waving of, of certain, of certain places. So, you know, yeah. to apply that to a missionary, you know, when I see my good friend, you know, Scott Russell, uh, draped in the Chilean flag at a, at a baseball game or a soccer game, you know, and, or and the Ohio really, state Jersey. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's not go there. Uh, that's crossing some lines, but, um, but, you right. know, but we look at that, that as Americans and shouldn't go like, Oh, that's disgusting. He should be wrapping himself in an American flag. No, I mean, he's, he's using even the flag in that place as a, as a way to build relationship with people and as an opportunity for connection and uh, to be able to be grateful, not just for his own, home country, but also for this adopted country. So I, I do think that even this idea, if we, if we get too tied into this nationalistic idea that we will actually um, put, put stumbling blocks in the place of, of the gospel and that we, we need to be free to be able to use these as opportunities to build relationships and, and to, 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 um, to love the people that we're serving and, and to have the freedom to, to, to use these, you know, to, freedom to function within these, these categories to, to promote yeah. the gospel. So for the five listeners that are left after Scott brought up circumcision, mm -hmm. um, and then, and then I brought up Ohio state and then derailed the whole thing. <laughs> yes. um, uh, let, let's talk about globalism because part of the current political controversy is the on the one hand, this, this nationalistic impulse, which is good if by that you mean patriotism, uh, but mm -hmm. if by nationalism you mean this, this weird idolatry of, of, of the nation, that's incredibly problematic. Uh, and on the other hand, you have, you have globalism, right? Which, again, if the idea is this, this missionary spirit of, of loving the country that God's called you to and wanting to see all the nations one to Christ, um, wanting to see the whole globe one to Christ, amen, um, and yet we also know that you know, within the, the secular framework, you know, globalism is, is related to, to humanism and it's putting man at the center and it's erasing all of the distinctions that God has providentially ordained, you know, in, in history. Um, Act 17, he ordains the, the boundaries between people, their dwelling places so that they would seek him. Well, humanism wants to rebuild Babel and, and in order to get back to Babel and, and to uh, put man at the center as the measure of all things, one of the things that has to be done is the erasure of, of peoples and borders and languages and customs and the melding of everything into one sort of homogenous whole. Um, and, unless, of course, you're somebody who would say Jesus is Lord. And in that case, you won't fit. But as far as globalism goes, hmm. you, you said a mouthful there that <laughs> you just okay, assume we all agree with. But that's OK. Let's keep oh. moving. <laughs> well, you, you can react to that. Yeah, I mean, the question is, is, you know, we, we talk about Christian nationalism and and. What, what would Christian globalism mean? So if we want to, um, if we want to repurpose the word nationalism, what would it look like to repurpose the word uh, globalism? How should Christians love the globe? And, and how do how do you do that without forgetting your flesh and blood neighbor next to you? If, you know, if, if it, people walked away with anything from this, I hope one of the things they would walk away from is realizing like terminologies matter and you yeah. can't just redefine terms, you know, uh, so, and we, we've talked about this a lot in other areas, but like nationalism and globalism have like historical contexts, but right. Yeah. Um, there, there is a way in that I think Christians do see the world and the people of the world differently than non-Christians. Um, um, our, like our, our presidential leaders, uh, whether, you know, talk about Biden or Trump, you know, they, they look at the, they look at the world through a certain lens, um, that Christians, we don't have that freedom to look at. We, we look at the world through the lens of Christ and, and in Christ, there is a type of global family, right? Where some from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation are surrounding the throne. And, and we do see, you know, like, like, like it's talked about in Isaiah, you know, of there's coming a day when, when, when God will look at, 
that Egypt to say, these are my people and Assyria, the, you are my people and Israel, you are my mm-hmm. people. And, uh, and, and that is, that fits within, a, uh, the, it's, it's the Christian scripture and it's the Christian, uh, future that, that we see that there is, um, there is this identity that there, there is one people of God and we are called to be, um, you know, a new, a new humanity in Christ. And so in that sense, and it stretches throughout the whole world. That's the beauty of the gospel, right? That it's, that it's open to everyone who calls in the name of the Lord would be saved. Um, not just, you know, Jewish people or not just American people, but anyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. So I, you know, I don't want to call that Christian globalism, but there is definitely a global <laughs> right. aspect aspect to that, that I think as Christian, as missionaries, I think everyone that's listening, that's a, that's missions minded, it will be passionately for. I, I love the passage from Isaiah that you brought up and it's a striking passage. I mean, yeah. imagine saying this in the context of, you know, and Isaiah is writing before the exile too. Mm-hmm. So it, it was, it wasn't necessarily the height of the nation. The, the nation was at its strongest under the United Monarchy, right? Under, under uh, Saul and, and David. Well, there, and there already was the Northern kingdoms though taken away. So he, he did, right, have, did have that right. shadow hanging over it. That was hanging over it. Yeah, yep. right. So it wasn't the height of the nation, but it was also before the Babylonian exile. Right. You know, it was before yep. the Jewish diaspora all over the world. And here he is, um, you know, it, it, the prophet Isaiah in the midst of pronouncing all these judgment woes and these sorts of things. Um, he, he says that that uh, there's going to be a day on which Egypt and Assyria uh, will be a blessing in the midst of the earth whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed be my people Egypt Mm -hmm. and Assyria, the work of my hands and Israel, my inheritance. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine how like somebody with, with the mindset of Jonah, (laughs) just the the hair would stand up potentially on the, on the back of their neck. Yeah. yeah, God is after all of the nations and, you know, uh, yes, these definitions do matter. So what, what should the missionary care about the nation, about the globe? And really what is the sphere of influence God has given us in all likelihood, he's given you a very small sphere of influence and we need to steward those things for the Lord. Uh, but going beyond that, yeah, American exceptionalism doesn't get at it because it's not just the fact that God has has blessed one nation or several nations in the West in particular uh, in incredible ways and, and other nations bless them in incredible ways too. Um, that doesn't get at it. What gets at it is what what makes a nation great? Can, can we talk about make America great? Like what would make a nation great is the impact and presence of the gospel. And as that nation is blessed with the gospel, what do they do? It's not just about that nation's greatness. It's about that nation spreading that greatness through the gospel to other nations. And for that, I go to Revelation 21. And this is a picture of, of the eternal state. But, but also, I think it speaks to the, the kingdom as it exists now in the world through the gospel. Uh, it, it talks about by its light, the nations will walk. So this is the new Jerusalem, um, the people of God, the church. By its light, the nations will walk. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there and they will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. So this idea that all the nations across the globe are bringing their glory and their honor and their, their culture and their contributions into the kingdom of God, the, the reign and rule of Christ, which we have now in the church. I mean, that is a, a beautiful picture, not just of the last day, but of what happens in the church now in this global body and this global movement uh, of the church. Anything to add to that, Scott? No, I, I, I love that. And I, and I think as, as Christians, I think, it, you know, at the end of the day, my encouragement is, you know, love your, love the place God's, God's put you, love the people God's put you with, be grateful for your heritage that God is, is giving you, but don't make it an idol. Like this is the danger sure. that any, all these good things can become idols for us. I got marriage can become an idol, you know, American, uh, heritage can become an idol and, and we need to submit all of these things under to, to, to Christ and, and to the providence of God. Yeah. Well, that'll do it for us. Thank you for listening today. Um, Before you go, make sure you smash the subscribe button. Make sure that you remember to share this with your friends, uh, but also leave us a positive rating and review in your favorite podcast app that'll help us expose this show to more people and have a positive impact among them. To share your questions and thoughts, email alex at missionspodcast.com. To get more content, go to abwe.org slash podcast. 
can also go straight to missionspodcast.com where you can hear our discussion of who are the nations from April of this year. Uh, You can find us on YouTube as well and, and get some video content on there. Until next week, thanks for listening.